I think about the culture as a whole, it's rich. It's not just about our music. It's about what our ancestors have contributed and what the individuals are still contributing to society. Our generation, generations after us, they need to know that it has happened, that it's taken place, and what's being done to change it. To be able to be free to be them without the pressure of um, having to conform to some standard that they cannot meet. And when we share the culture, it breaks down that prejudice. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. That's a quote from legendary writer James Baldwin that still rings true today. Good evening, I'm Jarrell Baker. And I'm Nakia Simon. Welcome to our Black History Month special. Together, we move forward. We're coming to you from the African American Museum in Dallas at Fair Park. And tonight, we'll be highlighting the history, issues, and challenges African Americans face in Central Texas in the Brazos Valley. We're also shedding a light on some of the triumphs, success stories, and the efforts being done to bring us together. Slavery and segregation have divided us in the past and still do today. The only way to address them is to learn from our history and move forward. The roots of Black History Month date back to February 1926 when Carter G. Woodson launched Negro History Week. But it took more than five decades before a U.S. president recognized celebration of African-American culture and its accomplishments. We're starting to see some of that progress being made in Waco. The lynching of Jesse Washington in 1916 is known as one of the most gruesome crimes to ever be committed in Central Texas. Now the community and the city have come together to place a historical marker in front of City Hall to make sure what happened is never forgotten. Every city has a story, and here in Waco City Hall is where one of the darkest moments in their story unfolded. It was heartbreaking. It was sad. Uh, very upsetting. In 1916, Jesse Washington, a 17-year-old black farmer, was convicted of raping and murdering Lucy Fryer, the wife of his white employer, in a trial that lasted only four minutes. Who would actually want that to happen to a family member, you know, knowing that they weren't mentally capable of doing such a crime? Yolanda Jones, who learned a few years ago she's related to Washington, says after he was found guilty, a mob of white citizens wrapped a chain around his neck, drug Washington to city hall grounds while brutally torturing him, and then hung him from a tree and set his body on fire. That's the sad part, and that's the hurtful part that someone, a lynch mob, can actually do that to a human being and not feel any remorse. Over half the population of Waco, men, women, and children with picnic lunches, viewed this as a, a spectacle and something to be kind of enjoyed as entertainment. Joe Welter with the Community Race Relations Coalition says Washington was just one of many African Americans who were lynched in Waco around that time including St. Majors, who was arrested and convicted of raping and killing a white woman in 1905, then hung from the Washington Street Bridge. Where we are as a community now has everything to do with all this terroristic lynching and keeping people in their place. Lead me more than 100 years later, the Community Race Relations Coalition, the City of Waco, and others have come together That's it. That's it. to place this historical marker in front of City Hall to acknowledge what happened to Jesse Washington, St. Majors, and others who fell victim to the violent lynchings. Showing everyone, even though the city's story has a dark chapter, it doesn't mean it's their last chapter. He may have been lynched, but that's all right. That's all right. He has been from a lich to a legend. The Waco City Council issued a proclamation declaring January 17, 2023 as the National Day of Racial Healing in the city of Waco. The proclamation stated by supporting racial healing, we can forge deep, meaningful relationships and bridge the divides to transform communities for our children and future generations. There are still issues which divide us today in our communities. One of those happening just weeks ago, a Bell County jury found an ex-Temple cop not guilty of manslaughter in the death of Michael Dean. 
Carmen de Cruz was accused of shooting and killing 28-year-old Dean, an unarmed black man from Temple, during a traffic stop back in 2019. The decision caused a rift in the community, sparking protests. Activists have called for police reform, transparency, and for the release of footage from de Cruz's body cam and dash cam of his patrol unit. The distrust between African Americans and police has been a major issue in the community and our country for decades. According to Mapping Police Violence, a nonprofit organization which tracks police shootings between 2013 and 2022, black people were three times as likely to be killed by police than white people in the U.S. And out of the more than a thousand police killings in the U.S. last year, at least 35 involved unarmed black people. Both the mayor of Temple and the chief of police turned down our request for interviews on the verdict. The city council saying in part, quote, this has been a difficult time for our community. We will respect the work of our justice system and we hope to now move forward together. We would like to express our condolences and deepest sympathy to the Dean family. Since the incident in 2019, the city has created a diversity, equity and inclusion board, as well as citizen police advisory commission to improve communication between citizens and police. Coming up, we're starting to see new faces in high places. We'll introduce you to some black city leaders around Central Texas. Plus, the woman known as the grandmother of Juneteenth is set to have a permanent spot in the Texas Capitol. Mayors, police chiefs, and other leadership roles have been around for decades in Central Texas. And we're starting to see black people step into those roles in McLennan and Bell County. Ian Chris sat down with some of those leaders to share their stories. It was a striking experience. I'll always consider it an honor. Working alongside Lester Gibson for two decades on the McLennan County Commission was quite an experience for Patricia Chisholm Miller. He was a servant who believed in, in the people. And so he did everything from the basis of, will this make the people in our community better? In honor of Gibson's contributions, Waco renamed the trail Jesse Washington was dragged down before his gruesome lynching as Lester Gibson Way. Miller said he had a passion for teaching black youth about their history and legacy. To aim higher, to achieve more, and to be better. I think if there's anything that he spoke into the hearts and minds of young people is that be your total best and then be better. Commissioner Miller now serves in Gibson's former precinct as one of six black women serving as a commissioner in the state. I look at the progression of African Americans, I look at the progression of women, and it can be a little daunting. So I'm just grateful for the support and humbled by the support that I receive in the community. I may be black and I may be a woman, but there is so much more to me. I am a leader. I'm smart. I am a giver. Being the first black female mayor in Colleen, Debbie Nash King says she had to overcome the doubt many African American women and men face within a leadership role. And I would hope that as we celebrate black history, that we realize how important it is for a young child to see a person of their color, regardless of what color it is, so they can have someone to look up to. I felt like that I had to represent. Waco Police Chief Cheryl Victorian says when she was in police academy, she was one of few women of color. Now she's the first African-American female police chief in Waco. We have these insecurities or this imposter syndrome, like, you know what? I don't see very pe many people that look like me doing what I'm doing. Maybe I don't belong here. Well, you absolutely do belong, but belong in that position if that's what your heart desires to do. The three black leaders say they want to encourage younger generations that look similar to them to have a lasting impact in communities across the world. I can't change history, but I will tell every African American child that they can make history. I am a living witness. If you put in the work, you can achieve your goals. Opali, the grandmother of Juneteenth, now has a new honor. Her portrait was unveiled in Alston inside the state Senate chamber earlier this month. Miss Opal is only the second African-American displayed at the state Capitol. She was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize in 2022 and is a driving force behind helping Juneteenth become a national holiday. When we come back, we'll take a swing at College Station and introduce you to a baseball legend who paved the way for African-Americans in the sport. 
Plus, we'll highlight some famous black athletes from our area. not know this, but there's an incredible amount of baseball history in Central Texas and in the Brazos Valley. Donna Conrad gives us a deeper look into the story of Rube Foster, the father of black baseball. Calvert, Texas might not be the most well-known town in the Brazos Valley, but it is home to one of the most influential figures in baseball history. He was just ahead of his time in, vir in virtually every realm of this game. And he should be a household name, but very few folks even know the name. Born in 1879, Andrew Rube Foster began playing semi-professional baseball for the Waco Yellow Jackets at 18 years old. Foster once pitched 11 games in 11 days and won every single game. And while he was known for his fastball, Rube was also credited with the invention of the screwball. The great manager, John McGraw, snuck him into his camp so that he could teach Christy Matheson how to throw the screwball and then Christy Matheson threw the pitch all the way into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. In the early 1900s, black baseball teams were taking the nation by storm. Foster, now a head coach, continued to find success on the diamond. His style as a manager was no different from his style as a player, aggressive and intimidating. He was adamant about this style of play. But it's also one of the reasons, Donna, that Negro Leagues baseball became a fan favorite. Roop was many things, a player, a coach, an owner, a businessman, but most importantly, a visionary. On February 13, 1920, Roop Foster held a meeting with eight independent black baseball team owners at the Paseo YMCA in Kansas City. It was on this day the Negro National League was born. After establishing his new league, Rube Foster boldly stood there at the Paseo YMCA and he uttered one of the most prophetic statements of all time. We are the ship, all else the sea. His vision to create this league was ultimately to force Major League Baseball's hand to add expansion teams like the Kansas City Monarchs or Homestead Grays to Major League Baseball. In 1981, Andrew Rube Foster was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame. While Rube did not live long enough to see the fruits of his labor truly pay off, it is because of that vision that the league saw success for almost 30 years. If you don't create this foundation, if you don't create this organized structure that gave a playing ground for all of this great black and brown talent, then you don't get Jackie Robinson. Next month, MLB The Show 23 video game will be released. This year, we've added a new gaming experience called Storylines. It will celebrate the Negro Leagues. Rube Foster is one of the eight iconic figures in the game. Bob Kendrick, president of the Negro League Museum, will narrate players' story in the game. Now we've seen incredible black athletes make their marks in several different sports, and some are even from Central Texas, including this guy right here, Mean Joe Green. You ever heard of him? He's from Temple. The NFL Hall of Fame defensive tackle was a part of the Steelers' steel curtain, leading the team to four Super Bowl victories. And cannot forget about our G3, Robert Griffin III from Comperscope. He's a former Baylor QB who also was a first overall pick in the 2012 NFL Draft. WNBA star and Houston native Brittany Griner played at Baylor for four years. She was a part of two Final Four teams and won a national title with the Bears in 2012. Griner is also a WNBA champion and a two-time Olympic gold medalist. Diversity in the STEM field still needs some work here in the U.S. We'll show you what two women are doing locally to help pave the way for more people of color at Texas A&M. Plus, the maternal mortality crisis continues to worsen for black women across Texas. We'll share the story of one woman who had to make a choice between her life or her babies during a difficult pregnancy.
We're starting to see more African Americans make headway in many fields, but unfortunately, we've seen slow progress in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or STEM. Now, according to the Pew Research Center, African Americans only make up 9% of STEM workers. Diamond Dixon shows us how women of color are helping pave the way for the future of STEM. Most people probably couldn't tell you what biological and agricultural engineering is off the top of their head. People hear agriculture and they think that they're going to be out in the farm somewhere, but that's not the case. But for assistant professor Dr. Janie Moore with Texas A&M, it's fascinating, which is why she's made a career out of it. I am the first tenure track African American faculty in our department, and our department's been around for over 100 years. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, African Americans are least likely to enter technology fields. Moore is working to add to those numbers. When I came, uh, the, we, we probably had one or two uh, black grad students, and we've increased uh, those numbers um, by 6% over the past five years. PhD student Nandi Kirk Bradley is part of that 6%. She says Dr. Moore influenced her to complete her master's and PhD at Texas A&M. I was able to see someone in my field of study, a black woman who's, you know, getting this, who's already have the degree that I have. Um, and that really was like a push to, to come to A&M and, and do the same thing. According to Pew Research Center, there has not been a significant change in black workers in STEM since 2016. There's also a lack of black and Hispanic graduates in STEM as well. But Kirk Bradley is hoping to change that. To kind of increase the numbers and change the conversation and how people view STEM related fields because we really want to see the shift from male dominated to female dominated as well as minorities. The future 2024 graduate hopes her research will find ways to better our environment and make a difference leading to changes for food and agriculture. I want to make a difference. Um, I work with insects right now and I'm trying to find a alternative to female to chemical fumigation and we're we're on to something. Dr. Moore says her efforts today are all about looking toward the future. If I could see more young people really interested in this area and then matriculating through to become the professors of tomorrow, that would be amazing. I would feel like I did my job. Thousands of black women have had near-death experiences or died from pregnancy and childbirth complications. Everyday women like Shiaja Simple, Dr. Shannon Irving, and Serena Williams is an issue that is getting worse every year in the state of Texas. We talked to one mother about her journey. Pregnancy and childbirth are said to be some of the happiest moments in a mother's life. But for some women, just keep me black women, um, I'll try to have another baby. It also comes with the fear of the unknown and a laundry list of potential complications. I don't want to imagine what would happen if you had a child without me. I don't think you would make it, but uh, I told him keep me. Sorry. Joya McGowan is the mother of Josiah McGowan. Before his birth in 2019, she sat her husband down to have a conversation no one could imagine. I know someone who also passed away and the doc, you know, the father panics and think baby, baby, baby. They don't think they'll lose their wife and then they wind up losing their wife. With the risk at hand, McGowan always prioritized finding a doctor who understood her challenges. Until my insurance let me know at 29 weeks, um, either I would stay with her, but I would be start paying at a higher tier of insurance. Now having to choose a different doctor, she was informed about problems with her pregnancy. It's not growing in his stomach area the way everywhere else is growing in his body, and that can cause some functions. I start researching. My job at the time had a midwife type of phone number where I could call her, and she was saying, if we don't see any red or red alert signs, you're good. McGowan says she had to constantly fight for herself and the life growing inside her. At 35, she was like, I'm writing a note to say you're going to have it. I said, this will be my last visit with you. I'm going somewhere else. You can't make me have this baby. It's a reality black women in Texas face, fighting to not be a statistic as the maternal mortality rate in the state increases. This is heartbreaking, you know, to see in black and white that everyone else improves except for you. 
Nikina Wilson serves on the Texas Maternal Mortality Review Committee. Its latest report revealed disparities still persist for non-Hispanic black women. And so I think the way forward is recognizing first that there's a problem and not, you know, explaining it away. But we know, and especially this last report, um, was the first that um, identified if discrimination played a role. Wilson hopes the committee research will bring about permanent solutions. As for Joy and McGowan, she was one of the lucky ones, but she hopes other mothers can enjoy their pregnancy without fear of losing anyone. It does not feel right. Body, pregnancy, mentally, it is not right. Get the help, get the resources, and keep asking around to make sure that you're okay. Coming up, banning books in the U.S. will take a deeper look on how this impacts future generations to come. And later, the struggle for equal education in black communities still lingers today. We take you to the Brazos Valley where a family of educators fought for integration. The struggle for equal education in black communities, like many other things, can be traced back to slavery. In the North, freed blacks would have to walk past the white schools like children if they wanted to learn in their own buildings. Desegregation of public schools didn't come until the Brown versus the Board of Education ruling in 1954. In Bryan, students of all races and grade levels didn't learn together until the fall of 1965. The young people of today, black and white, green and blue, all colors, we want them to recognize that we need each other. And to make this country even stronger, we need peace in our hearts and work for harmony. Before integration, there were a few black institutions across the city. Washington Elementary on the north side of town was one of them. Paige Ellenberger shares the story of integration in Bryan and some of the educators behind the push for change. It was something else growing up, just being a black American. But uh, we got through it. Laying the groundwork for black education. And we're very proud. Wasn't easy. They didn't have the choices that I have today. It's here, back in 1885, where segregation drew lines of separation. They had an opportunity to come to a place to get educated and learn. Back then in Bryan, you quickly learned that this was considered free man's land. This area right here was the only area they could leave. In this separate community, school created collaboration. The black schools uh, here in Bryan, that we had some good teachers. In 1914, the first black school in Bryan, wall to wall in wood, burned to the ground. We felt the differences in our neighborhoods. The Washington Park neighborhood rebuilt. I am so very proud, very proud. From community involvement to education, the principal of Washington Elementary, the new school did a lot. And you could tell he was exhausted a lot of times. Principal Oliver Wayne Sadbury Sr. before all was a father. I remember so many days he coming home from school and just laying across the bed before supper. Fighting for integration. He went out and wanted to make sure we improved the environment in the communities. His building burned in 1971. Sadbury retiring that year too, knowing his students were integrated into the city's public schools. It's a beautiful building. Over five decades later. I see success. <laughs> Brian ISD is naming its newest intermediate school after the late educator. Hooray for daddy. <laughs> yes, they, they, they would be as proud as I am. I know they would. For thousands of kids, no matter what race, and for decades to come, oh, wow. the groundwork is being laid for the future of this country. To know the past is to know the present, and to know the present is to know yourself. That's a line from the book Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism and You by Imram Kendi, one of the books that's on the ban list across the nation. Banning books doesn't make them illegal. It's just harder for us to have access to them. Over the past few years, we've seen a push to ban books by authors of color and the LGBTQ community, leaving readers unable to engage with black perspectives from our past that has shaped us today.
many of these authors that are being banned um, and erased and censored from curriculum also were some of the early uh, uh, researchers of Black life, right? The, the, the recent publication of Barakun by Zora Neale Hurston, she was an anthropologist who traveled the South. Some other books by Black authors that are banned across the nation are I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou, The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, and The 1619 Project by Nicole Hannah-Jones. Black History Month has roots and meaning everywhere, including in a person's hair. We explain the purpose of the Crown Act and how it plays a key part in ending discrimination. Plus, one woman is helping preserve our culture through music and dance. We show you why this tradition is an important part in documenting our history. There's a movement to create a respectful and open world for natural hair. It is better known as the Crown Act. It was created to protect against discrimination based on race-based hairstyles, such as braids, twists, and knots. While the act has passed in the Texas House twice, when it was brought to the Senate floor in December of last year, it was blocked. Texas Representative Retta Andrews Bowers is taking on the issue again by refiling the bill during this legislative session. Bell County representatives say they are in support of the bill. There are a lot of members within our community who are actively working with state legislators and um, trying to help get this initiative passed in the state of Texas. So there are a lot of um, components, a lot of moving parts here, but a lot of our citizens are actively engaged. And so to be able to um, stand with them as they're pushing forward on this is very important to me as well. Right now, the Crown Act is law in at least nine states across the country. Austin became the first city in Texas to pass the Crown Act last summer. City employers can no longer discriminate based on hairstyle. Well, if you don't know what this hairstyle right here is, these are called locks, and they're commonly worn by people of African descent. Ron Jupiter with the Colleen branch of the NAACP says locks can be traced back to the Judah tribe in Ethiopia over 100 years ago. Many who wore it rock it for more than just its style. It's worn as a symbol of staying true to yourself, refusing to conform to European and colonialism norms. Some may prefer not to use the words dreads or dreadlocks as they have a negative connotation applied to them. So the locks represents a political uh, description of our mindset, right? And I can't remember in history where my community haven't been struggling for something. It's been a constant struggle. Jupiter says locks are worn as a reflection of rebelling against colonialism Colonialism required you to comb your hair and have a neat appearance. Keeping black culture alive in Central Texas is what one woman dedicates most her time to. She's teaching children about the greatness that lies within them through the power of the arts. Christina Davis has her story. Welcome, I come to see your daughter. Meet Darlene Golden. It was a good, it's, it was a good positive song. She dedicates her time to song high bamboo roots. a nonprofit focused on teaching kids in Central Texas about their African culture through music and dance. And it's not like what you hear today when these right. guys talk about they come to see their daughter. They ain't calling them daughter no more. That culture, she says, is dying as mainstream music and dance become a deadly weapon to our youth. To hear the, the songs, it has no substance. When you think about the drum, it's your heartbeat. That's good. That's good. Boom, 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 boom. Good. It's life. And in Tori Stickland's life. The day she made me the proudest mom. She's got a little black girl to raise. She was having issues with some girls at school because they were making fun of her because she refused to twerk. Well, no, we can twerk in the house, we can act food in the house, but no, that's not to be done outside. Dance has been rooted deep in African culture, particularly during times of worship and spiritual exercise. The mixture, the bambula dance. It runs in the blood. 
But Tori says it's all about time and place. I believe in giving them room to make, to make life decisions, but also making sure that they're guided, teaching them about their roots and who they are and why they are that way. So she signed them up for Songhai Bamboo Roots classes because she understands. It takes a village to raise a child. All of these things, you know, was conveyed in the music, the language, the dance. The culture is all about your morals, it's all about your values, mm -hmm. you know. It's about the essence of who you are, your being, you know. Where you came from to where, where you're going. going. Progress has been made over the years when it comes to racism. Internalized racism still exists within the Afro-Latino community. A proud Afro-Latina in Central Texas says for her, being black and Hispanic are one and the same. Salabel is one of many Afro-Latinas proud of her unique background. She works in her mom's Panamanian restaurant in Colleen. It's the only one in the entire state of Texas. The family is keeping the culture alive, one dish at a time just black in general, that there can't be like black Hispanics and stuff like that. So I decide to like say that I'm black and I'm Hispanic at the same time. A survey conducted by the Pew Research Center in 2016 found that only 18% of Afro-Latinos identify as black, compared to 39% who identified as white. Almost a quarter said their race was Hispanic. Celebrating Black History Month can be done in several ways from taking time to honor those who have made strides for African Americans in the past or taking steps toward understanding the culture. Being a minority comes with its own challenges, but that never stops us from following our dreams, achieving success, and inspiring others in our communities. The African American culture is made up of people who worked through adversity and made a name for themselves. We want to thank you for spending the last half hour with us as we highlighted those in our community who lead, inspire, and create during the month of February. Good night.